Hello, everyone. My name is Preston Dennett, and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. I've got a fantastic episode for you today, I think. I call it Star Daughter, One Man's Lifelong Experiences with Extraterrestrials. These include not only UFO sightings, but face-to-face -face encounters, some with details I've never heard before, and of course, onboard UFO experiences. It's a very interesting case, and I think you'll enjoy it very much. What I like about this episode is I was able to interview the witness firsthand, of course, and I'm going to play for you the clips of the interview I did with him, so you'll be able to hear the descriptions in the witness's own words. The witness is Tony Dittata. He was born in 1946 in New York, and his first major UFO sighting occurred when he was just 17 years old outside his home in Brentwood, New York. This was in 1963, and he had gone out for a walk one evening. It was around 9 p.m., and he was just outside his home walking through Brentwood when he had a major encounter with a giant black disc at treetop level. It had little red lights all around the circumference, and I'll just let Tony describe in his own words what he saw. So I left my house, and I was starting to walk up the street towards her house, and this is still in Brentwood, New York. Um, I was looking towards uh, the middle of what would have been the town, and there was a uh, a black disc. It was a, an awesome thing to see. It was it was quite large. Um, I'm going to say at least 40 feet in diameter. Um, and I don't know if the thing itself was was turning, spinning, or there was a red light on its edge. And I don't know if that red light was going around the edge or the thing itself was, was spinning. And it was like... Um, with the front of it, the leading edge of it was uh, tilted towards the ground at like um, roughly 45 degrees. Um, and it was moving slower than a pipe of cup would be, I would say, 30, 40 miles an hour, maybe. And... Uh, it was, I was at ground level, naturally, and it was at, like, treetop level and maybe a quarter of a mile away. Wow. And it was going along, and it would, uh, I would lose sight of it behind, uh, like, a house, and then it would come out again, and I could see it again. So I, I ran back to my house. Uh, I was painting the house at the time, so there was a ladder on the side of the house, so I put the ladder up <clears throat> and climbed up on the roof to try and get a better look at, at it, and it, uh, it went behind the house, and then it would come out, and I could see it again, and then it would go behind the house, and I can't see it, and then it would come out, and I could see it again, then it went behind the house. And he never came back. I don't know what happened to it. I never saw it go up. I never saw it go away. I don't know where it went. So as you can see, that was quite a dramatic sighting. Tony's next encounter occurred just four years later in 1967. And this was an actual face-to-face -face encounter with gray ETs. Tony and his friends used to hang out Brent, at Brentwood State Park. This is in the middle of Brentwood in New York. And uh, they would just hang out, have fun, maybe drink some beers. On this particular evening, there was about a half dozen 
of them. Uh, they didn't have any money, so they weren't drinking beer at this time. And they hung out for a few hours, walked over to the nearby local golf course, and finally they decided that they were going to go home for the evening. Most of Tony's friends decided that they were going to hang out at one of the friend's houses. He lived right across the street from the golf course. But Tony and his other friend John decided that they were just going to go home. And so the group departed and Tony and his friend John were walking along and decided to rest for a few moments on a park bench overlooking the golf course. And this is when they had a very interesting encounter. It began when they heard this strange jingling noise like car keys or perhaps a dog's leash or something along those lines. They didn't see anything, so that was quite unusual. But it was just a short moment later when they did see something. And it was a gray ET just 50 feet away from them. And I'll let Tony describe what happened next in his own words. And we turned and looked at it again at the green, and there was a gray standing there. Again, about um, I'm trying to remember the distance. Maybe, maybe forty feet at the most. Forty feet away. And again, it was facing us. And I don't remember any facial features. And it it looked it was wearing what looked like a one piece type. Um, I guess today you could call it like a running suit, a sweatsuit, you know that kind of thing. And um, it was like the dull side of aluminum foil is what it looked like. And um, we both stood up and turned around and looked at it. And I turned and I looked at John and he looked at me. And, um, <laughs> and we both turned back and looked at it. And I, it, I, I don't think this was more than 30 seconds either. Uh, and it turned. And that's why I know it was facing us because it turned and went off away from us. And it went right down the middle of the golf course. Now, this is not lit up. You know, there are some lights there, but it's not, it's not lit up like, um, you know, to keep trespassers away or anything like that. It did. At that point in time, there wasn't. Uh, that kind of thing going on. So there was no need really for spotlights and stuff like that. But anyway, we could see this thing in the, um, I don't know, I don't remember now if the moon was out or whatever, but we could see the thing. And it was moving fast enough that it should have been running. But there was no movement. There was no bounce. And I don't remember seeing its legs moving. It was like either the yacht, the golf course was covered in ice or it was on wheels. And it was moving pretty fast, faster than a human could run. And off in the distance, I'm going to say probably a quarter mile away, roughly, there were uh, a group of trees and two or three uh, very tall pine tree. And this thing went behind this two or three pine trees. And then it came out. And another one came out from behind the tree. We didn't see. I don't remember seeing the other one. And then they both took off down the middle of the golf course away from us, and I used to see John up in the park almost every day. He was one of the regulars up at the park. So 
so I would see him just about every day. And I didn't see John again for three years. And I walked into the uh, Brentwood uh, bowling alley, and there was John sitting at the uh, at the counter. And I said, hey, John. And he goes, hey, Tony. Seen any little green men lately? And we both laughed. And um, I never saw him again. So what an interesting encounter, especially the way the E.T. moved, gliding across the golf course there without even moving its legs. It's quite unusual. And what's really interesting is what happened after this encounter. They went rushing to their friend's house to tell them and found them all asleep on the floor. It seemed far too soon for them to all have just fallen asleep, especially in that position. Tony and his friend John thought it was quite weird. After we saw this on the, on the golf course, we, we both ran to, to Dave's house, which was uh, like a half a block away. Um, I'm guessing a, less than a block away. And we ran, we ran to Dave's house and looked down in his basement and there were all, all the guys asleep. Now, it, I believe it was a Friday night. I mean, a group of guys sitting there watching TV, they're all going to fall asleep within like a half an hour? That doesn't make sense. John and I said, what the hell? Are they, how could they have fallen asleep so fast? Because it seems like we just left them 30, 40 minutes ago. There was about three years after this, um, my girlfriend, and we ran into this girl, her name was Katie, and uh, Katie was telling us that her brother um, was looking out his bedroom window uh, at like 2 o'clock in the morning, so there was nothing on the other side of his backyard except the golf course. Uh, so Katie was telling us that uh, her brother looked out there and there was a disc sitting on the ground with 11 little men walking around underneath picking things up. And it was around the same time that me and John saw the two grades on the golf course. And they went when they, when they left, they headed in that general direction. Right. But there seemed to have been, um, in that area, uh, from where we were looking out on the golf course, from where we were looking off in the distance, there seemed to be a red or reddish glow coming from roughly that area and i just you know i i would just like like to go back in time and <laughs> see if they're connected it was two years later and tony was dating at this point he had met a young woman and they decided that they were going to go to lake ronkonkama this was a popular hangout for young lovers to sort of get a little bit intimate and uh, overlook this beautiful lake. And Tony was there with his girlfriend. It was at night when they had a very dramatic UFO sighting. And again, I'll just let Tony describe in his own words this incredible UFO sighting involving two glowing disks. We used to go to this um, place in a town called Ronkonkoma, New York. Uh, there was a, a there was a there is a lake there, Lake Ronkonkoma, and there's a town there. And in part of the town, there was a trail you could drive off the main road and go up this uh, trail into the woods. And you could literally drive for about 15, 20 minutes through these woods, maybe longer. And 
and totally be away from everybody in the middle of Long Island, New York, you know? And so we would go back there and, and sit around and drink beer and talk and hang out. And then, you know, the guys and girls would separate. So me and Lori would separate and, you know, go make out and whatever. <laughs> and uh, this one night we're sitting out there and, and talking and I looked up in the sky and there's these two, they looked white, two discs, but these two discs seemed to be locked together. And they went, like, from what horizon we could see and to the other inside of um, 20 seconds. And they were... They were, they were white, and I don't know, naturally, I can't tell how high they were or how low they were, but they weren't, you could tell they weren't close. They had to be up there. And I, why were they so brightly white? There's no way if you looked up, you could miss them. There's no way you could miss them. They were pure white, bright light. But no sound. No sound at all. It was around this time that Tony began to have some very interesting memories. He's not sure when he first recalled being on board a UFO. It seemed like this memory had always been there. He just started thinking about it more and more, and it soon got to the point where he had to face the fact that he remembered being on board a UFO. And what's interesting about it is that he traces this memory to about the age of 14, which was well before his first UFO sighting and his sighting of these gray ETs on the golf course. So he's not sure how this happened. He doesn't remember being taken on board. He doesn't remember being put back but he does have a clear memory of being on board a UFO. And I'll, again, just let Tony describe his experience in his own words. I don't recall how, how it started, but I, I remember being on a, on a ship, being on board, and I'm sitting on a, a table, and it's like a, uh, not really a gurney, but a, a fixed table, uh, but like human length, you know, like maybe a six foot long table, seven foot long table, something like that, and I'm sitting on the edge of the table. Uh, with my legs dangling over the edge. I don't know what happened uh, because I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm in my underwear only. And this gray walks in and um, he puts his hand on my left leg, on my knee. And he looked into my eyes and I'm looking into his and he's maybe 12 inches from my face maybe a little less or that's all I can remember is, is looking into his face and as I'm looking at him his right eye in the upper right corner of his eye, it twitches, you know, like um, like a nerve twitch. And I that, for some reason, sticks in my mind as if to say this is a live, living creature. At this point in time, memories are kind of a little bit faded, but he took me out of the room and we walked 
out of a doorway, which was not a typical door. Um, everything you looked at inside of the the ship, there was no sign of any any kind of nails or screws or any kind of hardware or no uh, light fixture. But the room was lit, and I, I can't tell where the light is coming from. Uh, there is no corners anywhere. Everything is rounded, uh, even where the ceiling meets the uh, wall and the wall meets the floor. It's rounded. Um, and we walked through this doorway and to the right, and there was, uh, to the left, there was another doorway. And it uh, seemed like some kind of control room, maybe, or maybe the flight deck. Um, I, I don't know what to make of it. It's like a, a, a desk thing. Uh, and I'm trying to remember, I think there were two, two other beings in that room. And that's really all I can remember. I don't remember how I got there or when and or how I was brought back. Any colors were very pale. Um, pastel, uh, like yellow. I, I don't know, I seem to remember uh, the light being sort of yellowish, um, not a bright yellow. The room was, I don't understand this either, it, the room was brightly lit. But the light source, I don't know where the light source is. That is another thing that has bothered me over the years, being that this thing was that close to my face, there must have been communication, but I don't remember any any communication. I don't re recall any telepathic or verbal. I don't remember any sounds. It wasn't cold in the room or in, in on the ship, but it wasn't extremely warm either. It was just comfortable. I mean, no, no breeze. Uh, I can't remember smelling anything. He was about uh, four feet tall. Um, might have been the same guy. I. That's what I'm curious about because he looked to be about the same, um, except in this, uh, for, when I was 14, I could see his face. Um, and it's not like the Whitley Streeper um, communion uh, cover. It's not like that. It's closer to, um, uh, what do they call that? Russian uh, video that's out there, Skinny Bob. Yeah, it, the head doesn't look exactly like Skinny Bob. So as you can see, Tony's onboard experience is fairly typical. He recalls the rounded room, the indirect lighting, uh, gray ETs. He did say that the inside of the UFO was normal temperature, normal gravity. He says that it had muted pastel colors, no real furnishings. He did see a weird cabinet uh, and other sort of weird stuff that he found hard to describe. It's a strange isolated memory and uh, he doesn't know quite how this happened. 
when he was taken. It's very odd. And he never thought he discussed it with anybody, but he did later meet as an adult, uh, a childhood friend. And as they started talking, the subject of UFOs came up and his friend told Tony that Tony used to talk about UFOs all the time. I'll just let Tony describe this encounter with his friend and what his friend said. I ran into a friend that I, a friend of mine that was in school with me back then, and he, he said that I always talked about it. I always talked about aliens and UFOs, flying saucers. And I said, I did, really? And he said, yeah, you always used to talk about that kind of stuff. And I said, oh, wow. <laughs> that was kind of, um, uh, I guess, I don't know, I guess kind of a surprise. I didn't, I didn't know that I talked about it to other people. So as an adult, Tony became very interested in UFOs. He started working at a factory, later worked at a car dealership doing detailing. And he became so interested in UFOs, he decided he was going to do some research. He ended up joining the Long Island UFO Network. This was a UFO group that met monthly on Long Island. This group was headed by John Ford, who founded the group. Uh, Tony was able to talk with John Ford firsthand and John listened to Tony's story about his UFO sightings and encouraged Tony to go under hypnosis. And Tony was intrigued by the idea that he might have memories locked in his mind that he wasn't consciously aware of. And so he agreed. He agreed to go under hypnosis and actually had three sessions. And all three of these sessions focused on one particular puzzling incident. It was in the mid-1970s that Tony and his girlfriend, soon to be his future wife, decided to go up into the Catskills and up into the Adirondack Mountains for just a little trip up into the wilderness. This is something that they had done before, but on this particular trip, something weird happened. They became lost. Somehow they got diverted off the main highway and onto side streets. And the next thing they know, it is the next morning and they're parked behind a building, which turned out to be a diner. They have no idea how they got there. At the time, they didn't know what to make of it. They didn't even realize they had missing time. But now that he went under hypnosis, he recalled a very interesting and dramatic onboard UFO encounter in which he not only saw greys, but another type of entity. And I'll just let Tony describe this whole encounter in his own words. I remember we were driving down, uh, we got off the interstate highway, and why, I don't know. I don't know why we got off. And we were driving down the two-lane road, and I don't uh, I don't know what sense any of this makes. I'm just going to tell you what what happened. Here. <laughs> um, we're driving along, and there in front of us, in the distance, I can see like uh, fog, um, low lying fog, like very close to the ground, and it's covering the road. And then as it gets closer, I can see that the road is going into a decline. It's going like downhill, not a steep um, grade, but I guess gently, let's say, downhill sort of um, grade. And in front of us was water. And uh, that, I don't know what this means. I don't, I can't make sense of it. How could this road be covered by water? And I remember I had to stand on the brake because I, I was going pretty fast. And I had to stand on the brake and hope not to go into the water. 
And the next thing I knew, we were in this um, in this field, a very large open field. I remember somebody being to my right, standing to my right, but I I couldn't tell who it was that was standing there. And then I I remembered that it was her. It was my my girlfriend at the time. And um, she's standing next to me. And there is a... Um, I'm getting chills. There is a, a disc sitting on the ground. And this thing is... Uh, I, I don't know how to describe the size. It was tremendous. I mean, I've, I've walked up to 747s, and this thing made a 747 look like a Piper Cup. I mean, absolutely gigantic. And on her right and on her left, there was a gray. And on my right and my left, there's a gray. And they're leading us towards this disc on the ground. And there's a, um, I don't know how to describe where this came from in relation to the disc. It was underneath, kind of like a tunnel. Um, I guess you could sort of compare it to a jetway, that kind of thing. Um, and it was black. The walls, the ceiling, the floor were all black and looked like, and to my feet, felt like rubber. I don't know what that means. And there's um, the entire length of this thing. There is uh, light at where the, uh, the floor and the uh, wall meet. It's curved. And in that curve, there's light. And it's just like a long tube of light. It's not like, you know, fluorescent bulb here. And there's um, a section where you see the next fluorescent bulb with one continuous light. And it was like a sort of a lime green. And there was another tube of light at the ceiling where the ceiling and the floor uh, wall met, met. And I'm, as we're walking, I guess, walking into this thing, there is um, the two with her. She's in front of me. And I can see the back of their heads. And they're close. They have something on. And I think it might be black. And the two with me, I mean, I don't remember if I ever looked at them. And we get to the end of this walkway, and there's um, a column at the end at each side. I believe they were square columns. But again, rounded off, no, no corners, but kind of square-looking columns, ceiling to floor, about 12 feet tall. And there's some kind of writing on the columns going from top to bottom. Not really hieroglyphic-looking, not really Chinese looking or Japanese, but something along that line, I would say. And they're in the same color that's kind of. No, no, the, 
the lights along the floor and the ceiling were yellowish. And the, the light coming from the columns was like a lime green. And there's, this opens up into a, a very large, I don't even know what to call it, a room. I don't know what it is. It's a very large open area. And not far from where we walk in, there is a being standing there at like a podium. And he's tall. He's got to be eight feet tall. But I, I can't, I can't see what he looks like, except that it's a being, and it's alive. I'm not sure if it's, it may have, like, ropes on, a rope type of thing. Uh, and it's dark. Um, it's not lit inside this gigantic I don't know if it's as big as the um, the disc was, if that was the inside of the disc and that was its entirety. I don't, I don't think so because the disc was so big, and the underside of the disc was black. Also, the next thing I know, it's it's around six o'clock in the morning, and we're in the car. Me and her are in the car, and we're sitting behind the building, uh, sitting in the car behind a building, a small building. And I don't know how we got there. And I don't know what we're doing there. And I start the car, and we drive around to the front, and it's like a diner. So it wasn't just UFO encounters. Tony, like many contactees, started to have a wide variety of paranormal events. And that included ghostly or poltergeist type activity. He would hear footsteps outside his door. Other family members reported weird events. And I'll just let Tony describe one particularly dramatic poltergeist-like encounter. So here's Tony describing what happened when he had this encounter in the basement of his home? Uh, yes, when me and my two brothers were growing up, we had, um, I guess you would say, poltergeist activity. Um, there were, uh, it was a time me and my, my next youngest brother, his name is Rich. Me and Rich were sitting down in the basement watching TV. And me and my brother are sitting there watching TV. And this empty box comes sailing out of the room. And there was nobody downstairs but me and him. There was no one there. Wow. And it was like this box was um, kicked or thrown. Uh, because it was in the air. It's not like it just slid across the ground or a floor or whatever. It, it came sailing out of this room. And so the stairs were right there, and I ran up the stairs to hit the, the lights. And, I mean, we, we both knew there was nothing there. And we looked around, and there was nothing there. My mother said, Sometimes she would hear footsteps coming up the uh, the stairs from the basement, and figuring it was one of us, she would open the door, and there's nobody there. Uh, she said in the back room she was doing laundry, and there was nobody down there with her. She was just starting to put stuff in the washing machine, and um, she feels a tap on her shoulder. So she turns and looks, and there's nobody there. I don't remember 
how old I was, but uh, my brother and I slept in the same room, and he was, he was eight years younger than I am, so he was already asleep, and I was sitting on the floor watching TV, and um, I hear these footsteps outside the door. The door was closed, and then... Um, it's like, you know, you go to stand in front of the door and you, you take one foot and slide it. And then you take the other foot and slide it and come to a stop. That's what I heard outside. So I jumped up, I opened the door, and there was nobody there. Another really weird incident happened at age 12. Now that Tony had discovered he was a contactee, he began looking through his past to discover if there were any clues to this. And this one incident at age 12 came up. He was with his friend, Billy, who was also a young pre-teenager, and they were playing cars, just rolling this little model car back and forth. And this is when something very strange happened. It's unlike any incident, really, I've heard before. And I'll let Tony describe, in his own words, what happened while he was playing with his friend Billy. One of this guy's sons, his name was Billy. He liked building model cars and, and playing with cars. And I did, too. And so this one night, we were over their house in uh, Deer Park, New York. And... Um, we're sitting on the floor rolling a car back and forth to each other. And I'm sitting with my back against a uh, sofa. And he rolls the car to me and I missed it. So it rolled under the, uh, under the couch and there was like a skirt around the, ca- the bottom of the couch there. So I lifted up the, cur- the uh, skirting and... Um, I looked under there and I could see the car. So I put my hand under the couch and started reaching for the car. And right before the car, I felt a foot. And my hand went up the instep and I could feel like an ankle and then a leg. And at that point, I pulled my hand out of there. So I don't know if there were toes or not. I don't remember. But I'm, like I said, I'm looking right at the car. And there's nothing there. But my hand is feeling this thing. And I I jumped up, but I ran out of the house. I and Billy came running after me. Said, "What's the matter?" I said, "I felt a foot under that couch, and I, I have no explanation. This happened. Um, whatever was standing there had to be standing right through the couch, as if the couch wasn't there. I mean, it it it, it was not human." No, it was not human. Where the ankle and the leg are seem to be thin. And I I don't I I don't want to say scaly, but just not right. Not skin. It didn't it wasn't skin and it wasn't a shoe. And it wasn't clothing. It was a naked foot. <laughs> so like I said, I've, I've had weird things all throughout my life. So there were all these weird experiences going on. Uh, Tony doesn't remember anything happening for a number of years. And then he moved to Oklahoma. And one evening he decided he was going to visit his brother who lived in 
Tuttle, Oklahoma. This is a very small town, quite rural. There's not a lot of people there, certainly not when this incident occurred, which was uh, about 10 years ago in 2011. Uh, this was the July 4th weekend, and uh, Tony had traveled to his brother's house. There was a lot of family members there, some friends as well, and they enjoyed a 4th of July barbecue. It got dark. They watched fireworks in the distance, and finally, around 11 p.m. or so, Tony decided he was going to drive home. And he said goodbye to his brother and friends and everybody and started to walk to his car. And he clicked the little clicker on his car to unlock it. This turned on the headlights. And this is when he saw something very unusual. There was a gray ET standing in full view of the headlights. The headlights were actually shining on this ET. And it was just a few feet away. And I'll let Tony describe this incredible encounter with this gray ET. I walked out of the house and I hit my clicker to unlock my car doors. And when I do that, the headlights come on. And um, I wasn't looking at the car because I know what's going to happen with the car, you know. Uh, so uh, I was looking towards, uh, there's a garage off in there, uh, a few yards away from the house. I was sort of looking towards the garage area. And I thought I saw something out of the corner of my left eye. And um, I turned and there was a gray standing there, about four feet tall. Um, I couldn't see from like the, the knees down because it was standing in, in some tall grass. I, I stood there and looked at it, and it was looking at me, and it was like um, I, I, I wasn't afraid. And it didn't seem to be um, my feelings at the time. Well, I, I, I guess just interest, and I guess sort of a state uh, 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 awe. It finally turned and went towards the back of the house, and as it turned and moved away, I don't understand how it moved um, because it wasn't running. It was extremely fast. And I, I, I just, I mean, even now, I, I, I can't put into words how it moved. I've never seen anything do what this thing did. And it uh, went towards the back of the house in the backyard there. And there was a six foot chain link fence around the um, back part of the house. And uh, I thought I saw it jump and over the fence. And it, it was like 20 feet in the air. And I, 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 that, that blew my mind also. Oh, also, with the, when, when it was standing there and I was standing there, it's weird, but I don't remember any facial features or anything like that. I don't know. I could never understand why. I, I I don't remember any facial features or anything like that. It must have been facing me. So that's an amazing encounter. I've never heard anyone describing an ET 
jumping over a chain link fence and flying like 20 feet into the air. So, wow, I mean, that's just crazy. Tony did get a good look at this ET and how it ran. And I'll just let him describe again what this ET looked like. And for the longest time, I wondered why did that thing stand there so long? It had to be about 30 or 40 seconds. Um, I don't think it was any longer than that. I, I think it was like 30, 40 seconds. And I couldn't understand why it would stand there and not just turn and, and run away when the headlights came on. I might have just, you know, caught a glimpse of it in that circumstance. But it stood there. And then I, as I thought about it, I thought, you know, maybe it didn't run because I know it. He knows me much faster, much faster than I've ever seen anything move, animal or human. I don't know. I just don't understand means locomotion it used. I it just doesn't compute. I, you know, I, I don't know how else, how else to put it. The head was um, large in comparison to the size of its body, and it was. Uh, I, I'm not. I don't know what typical really is, but um, sort of typical gray looking head, um, larger on the top, kind of bulbous, and coming to a point, more or less, towards the chin area, very slim arms, and what I could see is its leg. I don't remember um, the hands, really. So immediately following this event, he ran back inside and told everybody. And there was a kind of an interesting aftermath to this whole encounter. As Tony says, and I'll just let him speak in his own words. And I went back into I went back inside the house. And my brother and his wife were sitting on a couch. And in front of them was a coffee table. And like I said, there was about 12 people inside. And um, I walked up to the coffee table and stood in front of my brother and his wife. And they looked at me and they said, what's the matter? And I said, um, I just saw a gray. And they said, what? I said, I just saw a gray. And my brother said, where? And it was like right outside the window that they were sitting next to. And um, everybody, everybody jumped up, turned on the outside light, and started looking around, you know. And by this time, you know, it was long gone, but... There was one little girl about 12 or 13 years old. She, I don't know how come she went where she went. I mean, people were looking all over the place. And she went right to where the thing was standing. And you could see a trail in the tall grass. And um, it was about the same size as she was. And, uh, when everybody ran out, they were like, wow, it was right there? Holy smoke, how close to the house it was. Because it was standing right, right off the corner of the house. It, it, maybe 10, maybe 10 feet from the house itself. Yeah, it never moved until it left. 
It just stood there. And that that bothered me for the longest time. Why why did it stand there long? I mean, thirty or forty seconds is not a long time, but in the, in the, in that setting, it's kind of a long time. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, you know, it, it take any animal, you know, for an example, it wouldn't stick around that long. The headlights come on and the thing would have been gone if it was a deer or, you know, some kind of animal. But, I mean, there was no mistaking what this was. It wasn't far away from me. You know, it wasn't like it was um, 100 yards or whatever. It was... It was really close. And that's another thing why I, I don't understand why I don't remember seeing, like, especially its eyes. And also, I've got to mention, my brother has um, two dogs. And one was a little dog, um, a terrier kind of dog. I don't remember exactly now, what dog it was, they've had so many. But um, they also had a big dog. It was like a uh, shepherd mix. And um, the the shepherd liked to be outside. This dog was always outside. And if it was raining and raining hard, they would have to drag the dog inside the house. He just didn't like to come inside. And this particular night, when everybody ran outside, the dogs ran in the house and went to the back of the house and stayed there. And um, my brother's wife told me that the next night there was something outside because both dogs came in the house and they ran to the back of the house and got under a bed and was hiding under a bed. And um, she said that they had all the lights on outside. (laughs) And my brother wouldn't go near the front door. (laughs) 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 Every time I talk about about this kind of stuff to him, he he has the um, attitude, well, you know, Tony, get over it. It happened. So, so what? You know, what's the big deal? And I don't, I don't understand why either that it it's changed, changed me. It's changed my life. It's changed the way I think and feel. Um. To be that close to something that is not from here, it's just, um, I, I don't know how else to explain it except to say that it's on my mind. I'm not going to say constantly, but a lot, a lot of the time. I think about these things. So as you can see, Tony has had some very interesting experiences throughout his life. And one of the most interesting is meeting his daughter, who is not human. Tony does have a son, uh, but he has never had a daughter, not a human daughter. But he has a very clear memory of seeing her. And like his early childhood encounter at age 14, he doesn't remember being taken on board or um, going back, but he has a very clear memory of seeing his own daughter. It's quite an emotional thing for him. He doesn't talk to a lot of people about it because many people don't understand, but he agreed to share it with me. So here's Tony's description of his, who he calls his star daughter. My mother knew that I had encountered. Um, 
I have I have the daughter who's out there. I know I've seen her once at least. I I don't remember the circumstances how it was that I got to see her or anything else connected with her except that she's not entirely human. I found a picture on uh, Paula Harris's website of uh, it's supposed to be an actual photograph of a, a, a hybrid and it looks just like her. My mother lived out in a town called Bayport which was um, I can't remember now in miles, probably about 30 miles from Brentwood and I, I lived in Brentwood and she lived out there. And um, sometimes I would call her up and we would talk. I would talk about this stuff. And she was from Oklahoma. That's part of why I'm here. When I became disabled, uh, being on a limited income, it's not too easy to live in New York. <laughs> so I'd been coming here to Oklahoma all my life because my mother was from here. And so my mother used to make this stuff that we called bacon gravy. <laughs> uh, here in the, in the South, there's something called biscuits and gravy that people eat. And uh, she used to make gravy out of, instead of sausage, um, grease, <laughs> and she'd make it with bacon fat, and it was so good, and I called her up one morning, it was about two in the morning, and I said, Mom, I feel like some bacon gravy, and she said, well, where are you, and I told her I was in Brentwood, and she said, um, you want me to come all the way out there and pick you up? I said, yeah. And I said, Mom, listen, uh, I have a daughter. And she said, what? And I said, I have a daughter. And she says, oh, Tony. She knew what I meant. And we talked we talked about it for a little bit. And there's... Uh, ooh, I've got chill. There's times, and I I can't explain this, so I don't, I don't know. I'm just going to tell you. Uh, there's times when I feel her, and I don't know what that means. But I know it's her. And I just feel her. I don't know if it's a thought transference or if she is actually near. I don't know. Another very interesting aspect of Tony's experiences is that he actually remembers a past life as an ET. Uh, this is not unusual. I've heard this from a number of contactees. Tony was quite surprised when I told him that. But here's Tony's description of his past life memories as an ET. I mean, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm 70 years old now, and I don't know if that has anything to do with anything. <laughs> I never thought about, you know, um, past lives or anything like that, except for 
one thing uh, and I sometimes I'm a little bit hesitant to say this but it, I I have a feeling that I in past lives I may have lived on another planet in another form for the longest time um and I, I, I can't explain this. I don't understand it. Um, but for the longest time, when I'm in the shower and I look down at my legs, they don't look right. Like my knees are supposed to bend the other way. And I should be walking on the balls of my feet. Where does that come from? <laughs> well, so am I out of my... Am I out of my court or what? So there you go. It's quite an interesting series of encounters. Tony's experiences started out quite fearful, but now as an elderly gentleman, he looks back on it as a blessing. He feels like he's gotten a lot of knowledge and experience and enlightenment from all of this. He wouldn't trade it for anything. He looks forward to having another encounter. He has no real fear anymore, but it has definitely changed his outlook. And I'll just leave you with one final quote from Tony about how his experiences have left him transformed. I'm, I'm really have been and still am confused when it comes to things that are going on here on Earth. And I tried to explain this to my son, and I, I really have no way to explain this, but I have a completely different look at this planet because it is only one of many and there's life everywhere I this is I I know this but how so when I look at things that are going on here I don't understand how things are, why things are the way they are. If everybody could understand and realize that we are just part and a very small part of a gigantic um, universe, I guess, for lack of a better word, full of life, there's probably things all around us that we may not even be able to see. How do you explain that? I mean, I, I'm no physicist or I get astrophysicist or anything like that. Where does this come from? And one thing I, I wanted to add, I don't know if it's important or not, but I just wanted to, that, that doctor that did the hypnosis, he told me that I have PTSD. Which is now, uh, and I don't understand why it's dissipated. I, it's not gone, you know. I can't, I can't sleep in silence. I don't like silence, and I don't like jet black darkness. I have to have some kind of light, and I have to have some kind of sound because I don't. The only way I can explain it is that. Um, I don't want them sneaking up on me. That's when I asked him uh, if I was crazy. And he said, no, that I wasn't crazy and all that kind of stuff. And he said, Tony, you have PTSD. I said, what? He says, yeah, you, you are showing signs of PTSD. Well, I... I have to say, I used to be that way. I used to not talk about it. Um, 
and keep it to myself. Now I just don't care anymore. I don't. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not looking. Uh, I'm not telling stories. Um, I'm not making up things. Uh, so you believe me? You believe me? You don't? You don't? Who cares? I don't. This is what happened. I'm telling you what happened. You believe it? Fine. You don't? Fine. Doesn't matter. I can only tell you. I can only tell you what happened. So that is Tony's story. I hope you've enjoyed it. I told Tony's story in my book, Onboard UFO Encounters. It's quite a fascinating series of events and shows how a person can have a lifelong series of experiences that start out somewhat fearful in some cases, uh, but end up being quite spiritual and transformative. Uh, so that's really why I wanted to do this video because it's a really interesting insight into what it's like to live your whole life with this phenomenon. And I really want to thank Tony for agreeing to be interviewed, for allowing his real name to be used. He's quite an interesting gentleman. He's got a great sense of humor. And uh, I'm very happy to see that he has come forward to talk about his encounters. So that's the show for today. Once again, I want to thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. I hope you've enjoyed this show. And until next time, keep asking questions, keep searching for the truth, and keep having fun.